morning, everybody. This is Josh Valentine with the Clean Coalition, communications manager for the organization. And uh, thanks for joining. This is the second webinar in our North Bay Community Resilience Initiative. Um, and uh, we have three great presenters today. Uh, this webinar, Electrification and Decarbonization in the Built Environment, Energy and Transportation Sectors, Model Structures. I want to go through uh, just a few technical points before we begin. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be sent to all attendees within two business days, so you will have those recordings and uh, slides before the weekend. All of our webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org, and on our YouTube channel. We will be having a Q&A session that the three presenters will take part in at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, please submit it in the chat box or the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel as shown on the screen here. If you have any more questions, please contact me and send me an email at josh at clean-coalition.org. Our presenters for today are our very own John Sarter. He's a program manager at the Clean Coalition. Panama Bartholomew, director of the Building Decarbonization Coalition. And Sean Armstrong, he's the managing principal of Redwood Energy. So we're gonna start off with John Sarter. He's gonna give a, uh, he's gonna give an introduction of the North Bay Initiative. And I'm gonna pass it along to you, John. Okay, great. Thanks, Josh. Um, so today, as uh, I'm going to start sharing the screen, um, this is the title of the today's discussion: electrification, decarbonization in the built environment, energy, and transportation sectors. And we're going to show some model structures also. Uh, as Josh said, we have three great presenters today. Um, real quickly, I'm going to go over um, the. Actually, I'm going to hold off on this, and I'm just going to pass it right on over to Panama to start things off. So we'll take it away, Panama. Great. All right, we're good to go. Well, thank you to the Clean Coalition, John, Josh, everybody for uh, having me. Um, I am the director of the Building Decarbonization Coalition. We are a coalition of energy providers, manufacturers, builders, designers, the real estate community, local governments, and um, non-governmental organizations uh, and we work together to try to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from the built environment um, here in California initial focus but as you can see we have a number of um, national and international members that seek to expand the lessons learned from our activities in California um, outside of this area so we're really happy to uh, really honored to be uh, asked to take part um, in this in this session and excited about the Clean Coalition's uh, leadership in this area. So we're talking building decarbonization and um, and if you really the John I think we can hear your uh, your keyboard in the background. Um, so we're talking decarbonization and when you're talking about decarbonization right now the, the issue and the that really comes up is what do we do with natural gas and the reason we're concerned about natural gas is largely um, this wonderfully well-branded uh, gas is um, largely is methane. Um, methane makes up anywhere from 92 to 98 percent of the natural gas that's provided to our buildings and to our power plants in California. And the reason we're concerned about methane is from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's a super pollutant. Um, as you can see on the screen, it's about 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, as a greenhouse gas pollutant. The um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, says that about uh, half of the global warming impacts that we're feeling right now are as a result of methane. Um, it's incredibly short, uh, short life cycle, as well as its uh, strength and ability to uh, more, uh, to be able to capture heat in our atmosphere more effectively than other pollutants is having a direct impact um, on us um, right now in the real time and it will be one of the bigger impacts over the next couple of decades and so methane is becoming an increasingly um, increasing area of focus 
as we're looking at decarbonization. And largely, it's not just an issue of in our buildings, but it's actually the demand for natural gas or methane that our buildings are creating. Um, this is a uh, map coming from a study from the Scripps Institute, and they looked at what are the what is the leakage rate of methane um, at well sites where we're extracting natural gas across the country um, and storing it before we're shipping it off to its end uses. And what the study showed is the different average leakage rates. It was a meta study looking at a whole series of other studies. What are the leakage rates of different uh, well sites and different basins across the country? And the leakage rate is going to be a combination of uh, geologic factors as well as regulatory factors. Um, here in California, we get we import about 86% of the natural gas that we use. Um, we import it from Canada, the Midwest, and Texas. And uh, the simple fact of the matter is that um, there aren't a lot of states that have put in place really strong uh, standards or uh, regulations for air quality. And so you have some significant release of methane um, in these different different basins. And so the, the buildings that we construct and the choices that we make about the types of technologies that we use to heat those buildings um, then create demand out of these basins with these sorts of leakage rates. Um, the Scripps Institute looked at where California gets its natural gas from, which basins and which percentage of natural gas supply do we get those basins from, and came out with an average um, leakage rate from the, um, from the California natural gas demand, and they figured it's about 3.6%. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at natural gas and methane, any type of a release above 2% um, negates its benefit as a fuel and against any climate change benefit of using it as a fuel compared to other fuel sources. And any emissions release over 3% doubles the greenhouse gas impact of methane at release at that rate. And so our 3.6% on average rate of release um, causing caused by the demand from our buildings is a significant issue as we look at ways to completely decarbonize our economy and particularly decarbonize our buildings. Um, then when you actually get into the communities um, where the natural gas is used, we have a wide variety of different levels of uh, emissions leaks from our infrastructure. Uh, this is a map put together by Google and the Environmental Defense Fund where they took a Google Street, a series of Google Street View cars, and they worked with the air quality firm Aclima to put in their um, high quality air quality sensors into the back of them, and they drove around for about six months. Um, a number of different communities across the country. This is Boston, and each of these little dots represents a methane leak. Uh, the yellow dots represent the equivalent of driving an average car about 5,000 miles one day from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. Uh, the orange dots, the equivalent of driving about 9,000 miles in one day or from California to India. And the red dot represents over uh, 9,000 miles in one day driving an average car, the greenhouse gas impacts of it. And so every community, Boston's obviously got a, uh, got a older infrastructure, so they're going to have more, but every community that we're finding around the country is, has um, leaks within their natural gas system. So from, from well to transmission line, all the way to distribution line and into our buildings, we're finding that we have a very leaky system. And so even if we're building a new building, it's relying upon a leaky system that's leaking methane at levels that are very damaging to our environment. Um, if you want a really depressing Twitter follow, if you're interested in these issues of methane releases, I highly recommend Gas Watchdog. They're a non-Russian bot that collects all of the news stories about um, gas leaks that are big enough to hit news story worthiness. So if the gas leak was big enough to hit a, a TV station or an online journal or a newspaper, they, they suck it up and they put it on their Twitter feed. Um, about five to ten uh, big news stories a day on that. So what you're going to hear a lot about in decarbonization is this issue of choice and choosing how we decarbonize our buildings and choosing electrification versus, say, some other choices. And so for my presentation, I'm just going to run you through some of the considerations you might want to look at when you're making a choice between whether you are choosing electrification for your building decarbonization or some other choice. Now, just as a reminder, um, I know many of you are not in California, but in California, generally, we use natural gas um, to heat our space, heat our water, heat our food, and then about half of us use it to heat our, 
are closed in California. And so the other choice is using our increasingly greening grid. We're at, um, we're going to be at 50% renewables on the California grid next year. And those jurisdictions that have large hydro or uh, nuclear power, which have their own issues, but from an emissions perspective can be beneficial. We're looking at about 75% um, emissions free um, electricity uh, next year on much of California's grid. So we use that clean electricity plus um, high performance, highly efficient technology to be able to provide those same heating uh, sources that we needed um, for our lifestyles. And so here are some of the considerations when we look at the choices between natural gas or electrification. So the first one being cost. And it costs a lot actually to provide gas to a house. You, know, you need electricity regardless of of any other choices, you need electricity in your average house. And here in California, it costs anywhere between $6,000 to $15,000 to bring gas service to a house. It costs about another $750 to $2,400 to then plumb for that gas. And then it costs just under $1,000 to provide the venting to have all the um, escape of all the gases um, from the burning of natural gas in your house. The National Association of Home Builders um, puts out a report every year called Priced Out, where they look at the impact of every additional thousand dollars on the cost of a house to the average family's ability to be able to afford that house and what the impact of that thousand dollars is. They looked at all 50 states and 350 major metropolitan areas. And for California, for this year, they found that for every thousand dollars you increase the price of a house through, say, regulations or fees, just under 10,000 families are priced out of the ability to afford an average house. So if we take the low end of all those costs I put up there for the infrastructure for gas, it looks about $7,000 um, per house to have gas service and then the attendant plumbing and the venting. And at times the National Association of Home Builders numbers, you have about 60,000 families priced out of the ability to be able to afford a house because of the choice we made to put in natural gas infrastructure. So you might ask, well, what about the appliances? Are these appliances much more expensive? Well, the California Building Industry Association, the trade association for home builders in California, they hired the research firm Navigant last year to do a big study looking into this. And what they found from that study is that these electric appliances either have no cost differential or actually can be cheaper than their natural gas alternatives, and that replacing uh, natural gas appliances with electric appliances can have significant benefits for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from new construction as much as 60% reduction for new homes. Um, you might ask, well, what about commercial buildings? Well, the, the firm Point Energy did a fantastic report for the University of California system for their uh, carbon neutral commitment, and they looked at academic buildings, residential buildings, and laboratory buildings. And what they found is this is a comparison of the net present cost per square dollar per square foot of building and operating these types of buildings. And um, you see on the, in the yellow bar, this is the cost of energy to, make, to run those buildings and the blue bar, the capital cost of building these buildings. And in each of these three types of buildings, they compared gas and electric versus all electric. And what the point energy study showed was that it's either the same cost or cheaper uh, from a net present cost perspective over 20 years to build all electric, to build and operate the buildings all electric. Um, here in California, um, we have uh, one of the highest rates of poverty in the country. 40% uh, of our children um, born each year are born into poverty. Um, and energy is a significant issue of that. 15% of our, of our families live in energy poverty, meaning they spend at least 20% of their income, monthly income on utility bills. And utility bills are actually the number one cause of people to take out payday loans. Um, here in California. And what we're finding more and more is that uh, natural gas is not a good partner in helping people to control their energy bills. Um, with, with, since we import 86% of our natural gas here in California, um, we're subject to competition for that same natural gas. And so these are some gas prices for California over the last two years. And when you have spikes in activity from the rest of the country, such as this February, when we had the polar vortex for the rest of the country, suddenly Ohio needs a lot more gas than we do, and we bear the impacts of it. And so you have a near uh, quadrupling of the price of natural gas. No family budget is factoring in a quadrupling of the price for the utility budget for that month. And so increasingly what we're finding is that natural gas provides a level of instability that is just not congruent with a family being able to budget around their utility costs. And if you look at it, if you look at the cost of uh, natural gas and electricity, 
um, over the last decade, actually we're seeing natural gas starting to creep up at a higher rate, about almost 6% a year rather than electricity. We've done a good job about keeping electricity prices relatively stable, whereas gas we're finding is just not a good partner for helping people that are really looking, that are living in a situation of energy poverty. But the beauty is that electrification technology such as heat pumps allow you to better manage that. Not only are heat pumps um, great technology because instead of creating heat, they're, they're basically transferring heat, they're incredibly grid adaptable so that you can use them in such a way that you can be, when we have a lot of renewable energy on the grid in the middle of the day, you can be preheating your water or preheating or cooling your space with that cleaner, cheaper, renewable energy rather than having to, um, or rather than having to rely on uh, dirtier grid energy um, when you're coming home, dirtier and more expensive grid energy. In California, we've done a great job about reducing nitrous oxides um, across the state. Um, nitrous oxides are a dangerous gas as, dignified, as uh, signified by the Environmental Protection Agency, one of the leading causes of asthma. They can bring on asthma-like attacks um, for, uh, for people even without asthma. And we've done a great job with power plants in California where we've been able to reduce nitrous oxide emissions down to only about 18 tons a day from our power plants um, across, the, uh, across the state. Our buildings are emitting six times more nitrous oxides than our power plants. The combustion of natural gas in our buildings are bringing about significant nitrous oxide emissions, just barely less than all of our cars across California. And so as we start to find ways to help air basins like the Central Valley or Los Angeles that have never been in compliance with the Clean Air Act, buildings are gonna be an increasing area of focus for us. Um, and what always comes up in decarbonization is, well, what about cooking? You know, what are we going to do about all of our cooking and, and moving on from, from uh, natural gas? And people love the natural gas stoves um, from this perception of control and, and power. But what we're finding is increasingly high levels of indoor air quality impacts from cooking with gas. And this is a study at the bottom of the screen from Dr. Singer's research at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. He runs an indoor air quality cooking team. And this is a 2014 study where they modeled 60,000 homes in Southern California based on existing research. And what they found was dangerous levels of nitrous oxides, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde at levels that would exceed ambient air quality standards. And the, Dr. Singer said, if we were finding these levels outside of homes, we'd be able to take regulatory action and there'd be penalties and fines about this. But because we are um, finding these in people's homes, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, formaldehyde is one of the leading causes of childhood and pet leukemia in the world. Um, carbon monoxide is one of the leading causes of uh, death from combustion activities uh, within buildings. Now, we're not saying that we need to be going towards this technology. Really, what we're talking about is the, uh, the Tesla or the electric vehicle of the house going towards uh, induction cooking. And so I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit in order to preserve time for the other presenters. Um, from a climate perspective, right now in California, when you look at greenhouse gas emissions from a uh, end use perspective, um, so where are the, where's the energy that's creating the greenhouse gases being used? Buildings represent about 25% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in blue, you can see the electricity that's being used for California. In yellow, for California's buildings, in yellow, you can see the natural gas use, and in gray, the uh, refrigerant uh, releases. And so buildings from an end use perspective are just about a quarter of all the state's greenhouse gas emissions. And we've done a great job with electric power. This shows from a source perspective where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from over the last two decades. We've done a great job with electric power, um, making it cleaner. And the new law signed last year, Senate Bill 100, will require us to completely eliminate emissions from the electricity sector by 2045. And so what that creates is it creates an opportunity for us to be moving towards zero emission building sector. You know, this is a chart that shows emissions from an average building being built under the brand new building code that'll go into effect January 1st. And on the left, you have a dual fuel building that by 2045 will have eliminated emissions from the electricity sector. We're still gonna have all those gas emissions. Whereas on the right, if we have all electric buildings, as we eliminate all of the emissions from the building, from the electricity sector, we actually have a chance to completely negate emissions from the building sector as well. So that's new construction on existing buildings. The real opportunity is stock turnover. Your water heater is going to break every eight to 12 years. Your furnace is going to break every 15 years or so. And so our opportunity for existing buildings is there's inherent demand built into these technologies and their turnover of their stock. 
And so we need to be creating the market conditions so that when that happens, we can help people make better decisions around building, around replacing their technologies with electric technologies rather than replacing them with fossil fuel burning technologies. So just to sum up, electric buildings, they're cheaper, they're more equitable, they're healthier, they're more climate friendly and they're safer to use. There is no good reason right now for us to be building any new buildings with natural gas. It is out of alignment with our climate change policies, it is out of alignment with our ratepayer policies who are gonna be stuck with the cost of these stranded assets. And it is out of alignment with our development policies as is raising the cost of housing in California. So we are not alone in this journey, but we're not leading anymore. Um, this year, the United Kingdom says that as of 2025, no more new homes will be able to be heated by gas. And the Kingdom of the Netherlands this year is, in, um, is cutting off all new construction to gas. And each municipality in the Netherlands is having to do a plan over the next two years about how to get the, their municipalities completely off the gas system. I'm encouraged by Governor Newsom's budget where he set aside one and a half million dollars to develop a plan to how to wean the state off of fossil fuels completely. And I look forward to a future webinar where we're able to put California up here in the same leadership position. So thank you for the opportunity to present and I'm gonna throw it over to, uh, to Sean Armstrong now uh, to present on how you actually do this in projects. Woo hoo! That's awesome. Let's see here. So um, can I get a confirmation you guys can hear me? We can. Yep. Awesome. All right then. I'm gonna take... So hello everybody, my name is Sean Armstrong. I'm gonna discuss today um, the lessons I've learned since about 2005 when I started in affordable housing development as a project manager. And then in 2011 when I began as a consultant Helping people like these people, these are, this is a farm worker family in California. They are in the area that grows a lot of our raisins for the country, the grapes that are dried into raisins. This is their home. It's 100% solar offset. Um, it was built essentially for the same cost as a gas home because as Panama was pointing out, the seven to $15,000 in savings by making this an all electric development, it paid for the $8,000 solar array, but it cost to make this 100% offset. That's um, like a, a key insight essentially into our code this year. The 2020 code, the one that's you know, officially called 2019, that comes into power in 2020. Right now in 2016, if, if we were starting, when I, when I started in my career in this business in 2005, I was under a code that had us performing at 100 to get a building permit. So that was my baseline experience. Um, right now, we're at a 65, you're using 100 as the top of the scale, so we've gone down to 65 in efficiency. Right now, we're the world's most efficient building code in California. Next year, you have to get down to a 41 to 48, and, and you have to add enough solar to get you to a 15 to 27. The code is supposed to be 100% offset, according to laws that we passed back in 2006 and up to 2011, but nonetheless, we hadn't, as a state, determine how to address the 40% of a home that could be gas. So that's why we're at a 15 to 27. The key insight that I bring to my clients, which are all affordable housing developers, is that the least expensive way for them to get to their goal, which we demonstrate time and again with new clients, they go out and they do all the competitive bidding for themselves. They, they I make an assertion, they confirm. Um, so I've got like 20 clients that are big affordable housing developers and they can all see that it is actually less expensive, so significantly so, to go all electric, that it makes a significant contribution to a 100% solar offset, if not actually paying for it. Now, this California-centric insight, I wanna point out that the South has been doing this for a long time. <laughs> right now, we have almost 60%, maybe more, of all of the housing being built in the South, like Texas and Florida, as well as um, uh, Georgia, it's being built all electric. It's because it's just cheaper. Um, as Pamela pointed out, it's not for an environmental reason. Uh, these are all savvy developers who are cutting out small, you know, groves of pine forest <laughs> or, you know, scrub where they are, wherever they are, and then putting down a new subdivision. And then the most expensive thing is the piping. It's not so much the appliances. That's like a thousand, two thousand dollars of additional cost if you get gas appliances. But it's the piping that's the you know, $2,000 per home plus the 6,000 to 15,000 out in the street. That's what savvy developers are trying to avoid. 
for instance, the Hyatt Regency, very nice building, um, a very nice complex, I should say, because it has a mall and it has like four restaurants and it's, it's a whole experience. It's an all electric development in Waikiki Beach. And in fact, there's literally dozens of all electric hotels in Waikiki Beach. Um, they're, they started building in the 60s and they only got their first little bit of um, module. It's not actually natural gas, it's a different derivative. It's like naphtha that they convert. Anyway, uh, Waikiki Beach, Honolulu, they didn't have gas when they were developing heavy duty in the 60s and 70s. So um, a lot of these legacy buildings that are gorgeous and have been redone, they continue to be all electric. Um, this is nice, these residences here, the Ritz-Carlton. So if you look in the top middle, you can see their induction hub, like in their executive ambassador suites and, and the, they actually, you know, sell um, suites up on top. It's just, this is luxury, that's my point. Look, the Trump International Hotel is all electric. <laughs> Um, over here on the left, you can see the the protesters from the windows um, watching. I'm oh, sorry, the, the clients watching the protesters. I want to just throw that in there. This is um, savvy developers, or even some that are seem to not be as savvy. They can all come to the same conclusion that all electric is still cheaper to build, and you can sell it as luxury. So the BIA gave us an award for this insight. Uh, this is farm worker family housing. That's in Oxnard. And uh, there's the architect and some of the team. Uh, so we got an award for demonstrating that it was cheaper for them to build all electric and efficient here. And I said, wow, we didn't know that. Here's an award, sustainability award. United Nations gave us a similar award. We were able to demonstrate really clearly in the finances of this project that cheap solar was so cheap, so financially beneficial, that to this project, it brought a net benefit of $600,000 for a project that was about a million over, this the, the solar array and the electrification that allowed to completely solarize the bills, that was the, the key piece of funding that got this project to be the first ever farm worker family housing built in Yellow County, where most of the almonds that you guys eat come from. These people were literally, literally living in shacks, crappy old hotels, tents, all of that. So the all electric plus solar design also got a DOE award. It's it was really clearly illustrated there, and it's been clearly illustrated dozens of times now in our developments. So it's not just affordable housing in Sean Armstrong's portfolio. This is just market rate housing. <clears throat> um, I wanted you, <clears throat> pardon me there. I wanted you guys to see that up in Vancouver, it's a very common practice to build all electric. They have inexpensive electricity, but they also acknowledge that like, stoves cause fires. And gas fires cause more fires. There's more explosions. There's more open flames. And if you can put in a safe induction stove, these apartment buildings are much safer to own and to build. And to, that's what developers want, is to not have fires for real. All right. <clears throat> so I want to show you what it looks like, though. What does a community of homes look like? These are three different developments, all identically built, all built in the same year, the same populations. And this is all the two bedrooms. Just see how, yes, there's an extremely predictable average, but the range every single day of the year for a whole house that's all electric is, you know, tenfold or more. And we see that everywhere we go, that people are very different, um, the top users and the, and the lower users. When we, when we get a zero net energy development, what that really means is about 60% of the households have no bills and 40% might or probably do. 10% are definitely going to have bills, the highest users, and you know, people with um, breathing equipment, people who have a, a whole bunch of kids and they stay at home during the day. So uh, just wanted you to see, this is the, the, the personal fingerprint of what you living in a house are like. It's made large. But when we design one of these efficient apartments, it all gets settled out, the noise gets cleared out, and we can see that in red, the domestic hot water load is the number one. That's a heat pump water heater, followed by plug loads. And those can go back and forth depending upon the efficiency of the water heater. Those are newer ones are better than what's being shown here from 2014. But then the next one is cooking. After that's lighting, then the fridge, then the HVAC. These apartments are only turning on their HVAC system one out of three days of the year. The, the next generation that's just built up the road, they're only doing it one out of seven days a year or they're using their HVAC system. 
And that's what an efficient shell to a building can look like with like a decent, just an always on bathroom fan for ventilation and windows. Incredibly efficient HVAC systems. Um, I want to sort of help you guys understand that people, that the house is the first big user. So one person household uses 13 kilowatt hours. A six person household only uses 19. There's only one extra kilowatt hour per person that you add. So the least occupied homes are the least efficient. The most occupied homes are the most efficient. That's the fundamental of how we're seeing from now almost 500 homes. That the more occupied they are, the more efficient they are per person. Now, to give you guys some of the, like the secret sauce for development. Um, on the left, this is the least cost way to heat and cool a home. And this is a, it's a through wall system, but you have it as a packaged heat pump. It's an air conditioner and a heater. It's a, essentially a reversible air conditioner. And this is an example where you have just two, tuck, two ducts that go through the wall and it just hangs on the wall. It's 120 volt plugs in. Now in the middle are products like I have in my own home. I have just one of these heads and it's an 1100 square foot home with a compressor outside. Those are more expensive because they have to be field installed. There's a refrigerant line in between those two products as opposed to the left that's factory installed. And that really raises the price of the field installation. And it introduces more leaks, which is important because these are high global warming potential chemicals. Not much of them and way less bad, like one tenth as bad as the gas that's leaking from the grid, but still. And then on the right, this is what you'd frequently see for homes, like a larger house is a big compressor that goes to a ducted system, more powerful, just bigger. Ducts are kind of inefficient, and it costs more to deliver energy that way through ducts. Bigger fan, bigger compressor, everything's less efficient. So that's the range that I show developers of like what it's going to cost to get more or less the exact same heating and cooling into a home. It may or may not be as well distributed, but that's what it takes to get it in there. So this is an example. These cute little homes. All zero to energy. Everyone here gets a $200 bill back. They're all low-income seniors in Fort Bragg, a really nice little coastal town. Uh, 26 homes. Each has four kilowatts of PV. That costs them about $8,000 to install total. Um, there's a payback, like I said, of about five years. They have duckless mini split heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, which you can see there. It's essentially a little air conditioner on top of a tank of water. Uh, like they just got like so-so ranges. We got really well insulated walls and everything was inspected so it's perfect. What's important is that we, these are really well inspected and so they're much better built because we found so many problems and we always do find so many problems with construction. It's best to, uh, to inspect. Okay, uh, this is the house that was actually on the cover or one of the 48 houses there. You can see there's the big compressor on the left. That's the fan coil in the middle. That's what blows the air around in the drop ceiling not in the attic. That's against the code now in California. Can't put ducts up in attics anymore. There's the heat pump water heater. You see a little pie chart of what the energy demand looks like. Um, you know, plug loads in this one is the number one load. Right there up with the combined heating and cooling. And it is an insight, you know, plug loads, which are huge, come from the audiovisual system and the home office system. Anything that runs on a battery is not a problem, and nor is its charger. Anything that runs on a battery is not a problem. But everything that doesn't run on a battery that's a plug load is a problem, particularly like home office systems that don't have turn off, things that don't turn off. There's so many home office audiovisual systems that don't turn off that use a lot of energy. Um, some people say like, is electricity cheaper than gas? Is gas cheaper than electricity? <clears throat> it really depends upon two things price locally for those two resources, which can be highly variable, like fourfold, and also the efficiency, because a heat pump water heater is four times as efficient or uses definitely one-fourth as much energy as the best gas water heater on the market. So you combine these two things, way more efficiency out of electricity, but it has a different rate, rate schedule. The result is on the left, that's what a heat pump water heater costs on average in the United States. It's 30% less than the least cost, highest efficiency water heater that's on the market. It's just the same products, essentially, doing the same job. 30% less expensive. Electricity is cheap. 
I've heard a lot of people say the word gas is cheap, that it's an uninformed statement, and I'm trying to give you guys information. Electricity is cheap. You know, it depends upon the price and the efficiency. Here's the average price, and here's what a high-efficiency product looks like. This is the one that everyone uses, by the way. It's not, like, super expensive. It costs the same as a on-demand gas water heater, which is, like, 80-90% efficient, and this is 370% efficient. <clears throat> so I presented to a lot of developers yesterday morning locally, like a dozen of them. These are, like, literally the good old boys, all men, crusty in their 50s and 60s, grouchy, um, and they just want to know about this whole electrification thing. They liked it because they knew it was going to lower their costs. We talked about it for like an hour. It, they all agreed with their own pricing. That it would lower their construction costs. They were supportive. And this is their only question. Like, what are the $500 stoves? So here they are. Here's examples of nice, smooth top electric radiant underneath that are nice. They're not as fast as the induction stoves. They're not as controllable as induction stoves, but they're nice. On consumer reports and online reviews, this is what it costs to get an induction. It's about twice as much to get essentially the same quality or maybe a little bit higher quality, though, stove. This is what it looks like to have a heat pump um, for your swimming pool and your hot tub. Uh, there's a friend of mine out in the dunes here who has a, a swimming pool inside of a greenhouse. And he just took out the $30,000 solar thermal system and put in the, the one that's on the lower hand right there. And that's about a $5,000 installation. And now he can keep his swimming pool at 90 degrees in the middle of winter time. And I take my whole family over and we go on the rope swing and we get to have a banana or sugar cane or pineapple that he's growing in there. And he was never even able to do that before he had a heat pump plus his PV system on the roof. It's, it's really quite nice and it's much, it's superior. Um, this is evidently superior to putting a solar thermal system that was six times as expensive on um, to do the same job. And so uh, another sticking point for some people is decorative fireplaces or recreational fireplaces or outside fireplaces. All of those have electric options. They've got an electric element to blast heat at you, and then they evaporate steam, water, I mean to say, into steam, and then they light it with LEDs. So these are all steam LED lit flames that you're looking at, and they're terrifying to stick your hand into. It looks exactly like flame. Like it literally is scary, um, but it has no heat. It's just the heat is blowing out at you from the, the, the heater below. And it's not the heat like a thousand square foot house. It's plenty good. So um, that was my last slide. I just want to take you guys through some of the technologies and what they cost and the efficiency arguments. I'm doing this in reverse on purpose, just to remind you. Um, you know, the range of costs and get more or less the same job done. So you understand how people are and, and that developers are really on board. All of them, <clears throat> the good ones, the bad ones, all of them can see that all electric is less expensive to build. And that is their number one concern is to lower the first costs of construction by um, like lowering construction costs. They, seriously, any conversation with developers, that's what they want to talk about. So. With that, I will conclude, and I'm going to change the presenter to John. Um, John, are you ready to take the handle here? I'm ready. Uh, right. Sean, Sean and John, before, before we go ahead and do that, um, this is Josh uh, from the Clean Coalition. just want to remind everyone to, if you have a question, please submit uh, the question in the question or chat box on the GoToWebinar control panel. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. All right. Thanks a lot. And we'll go up to John. All right. I'm reading myself here. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Panama. Startling statistics on gas leakage and the environmental costs there. And, and Sean, for showing us the tremendous value in going all electric. Um, those are amazing statistics. And I'm glad to hear you addressing the pool of developers and builders out there, the crusty old dudes like myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our community initiative up in the North Bay, North Bay Community Resilience Initiative. These are the goals of the of the project uh, to publicize electrification going and the programs being offered by Sonoma Clean Power, MCE, Bay Ren, Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and others. And another part of our effort is to procure and develop a database of model structures with that are all electric and are community microgrid ready. As part of that effort, um, we have developed a, an electrification and community microgrid ready document, ECMR document we call it, for homeowners and installers, and I'll get into that in a minute. 
Um, and then these homes can actually begin to connect into community microgrids. So we're creating a community microgrid roadmap, beginning with the most important places, critical facilities, hospitals, fire stations, and the such. We're positioning these pilots in areas that are conducive to expand into community microgrids. And all of this is developed as a model for decarbonization and resilience in the communities for rebuilding and building and for proactive resilience and community modernization going forward. And that's not advancing. Why is it not advancing? Hold on a sec here. Uh, I found you just have to like click on your screen. You've been clicking anywhere else to yeah. click back on your screen and then it activates it. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. So I mentioned the ECMR document, Electrification Community Microgrid Grid Ready. This is a, a very simple two-page document. Um, page one has definitions and operations for grid connected in normal operation over here and emergency operations when it disconnects from the grid and, and islands. Um, and then page two has recommendations for wiring for connected appliances that can take up excess solar power that might be on the grid um, and solar and solar ready wiring for energy storage um, for connectivity for the communications from these systems to be able to interact with the grid or microgrid. And then also we have at the end, we're starting to do additional recommend, recommendations um, and those for commercial buildings as well. And of course, the best time to put these things in is either when you're building or remodeling and you can refinance it into the project as a whole because then you're paying over it for the life, over the life of the 30 year mortgage as opposed to you know, upfront um, initial costs later on. So the ECMR document goals are obviously electrif electrification and decarbonization through community microgrids and uh, Panama and Sean both touched on the benefits, safer and healthier homes and communities, You're eliminating natural gas, which is flammable, produces toxic gases within the home and community. You're creating resilience within the community and you're reducing your dependence on outside fuel and energy sources. You're reducing greenhouse gases, and you're also allowing a much greater adoption and utilization of, of EVs, electric vehicles. You combine all these together, and you're looking at the eventual elimination of fossil of all fossil fuels, in, including transportation fuel. And I'm going to go into a little bit about the EVs. They can become mobile energy assets that are both saving and making money for you in your home and in the community. So the microgrid effort. Um, and the benefits of microgrids are obviously you have more resilient homes and communities that are capable of staying powered when there's a grid outage, such as the power safety shutoffs that are about to start occurring up in, in Northern California. Um, that creates resilience and security. You have local renewable energy plus storage, energy storage as your primary power. And the energy that you're producing and generating locally and storing creates permanent local jobs, which are great for the community. And then now there's a new ruling from the California Public Utilities Commission that is allowing the aggregation of these behind the meter and community energy storage assets as grid balancing assets so they can start to participate in the, in the grid market. And this will generate revenue not only for large storage producers but, but aggregations of smaller users. So these systems are actually going to start to be able to produce money for you as well as give you resilience. And then the end result is obviously the elimination of the need for fossil fuel peaker plants as we move forward. So our model structure partners, um, these are some of the organizations that we're working with to develop our database for model structures, and both for new and retrofit residential, commercial, and municipal buildings. There's some of the highest performance-based building organizations, organizations in the USA. Um, we're working with the USDOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program, Passive House Institute, U.S. Green Building Council and New Buildings Institute, and they have a new program coming out that they call Grid Optimal, which are just exactly what we're talking about, homes that can interact and be partners with the grid, uh, Net Zero Energy Coalition and the Rocky Mountain Institute and others, as well as Panama and Sean's organizations. Part of our model structures effort is to showcase the advanced energy rebuild homes that are being uh, built in Sonoma County in the wake of the fires. This is a program from Sonoma Clean Power that will give people up to a $17,500 incentive to fully electrify and go solar and storage and microgrid ready, essentially. So 
not only are you saving money, uh, but these folks are actually able to, to make quite a bit of money back um, by not utilizing gas in their homes. So having a microgrid means that when the power goes out, your power stays on. That's one of the major benefits. Uh, Sonoma Clean Power currently has 190, 190 homes enrolled in this program, and they'll also be opening a new uh, advanced energy center in Santa Rosa that will allow people to go in and, and even borrow induction cooktops uh, not cooktops, but little burners to test them out, see if they like them. Um, they'll also connect you and purchase avail uh, options for all electric appliances and even contractors that can help you install and plan foods. Another organization that we're partnering with is the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar Decathlon program. Um, the Solar Decathlon is a biannual competition that they've been holding since 2002 comprised of universities uh, across the U.S. and globally uh, to design, build, and present zero net energy homes. So they have a, a full database of model structures that they've developed through these per this period of time. And some of them have been simply designed. They have a design challenge which prepares creative solutions for real world issues. And they also have a build challenge where they're actually constructing real world projects with their designs. And this database is available uh, through our model homes program, model structures. Um, the other effort that we're trying to help push forward is to use modular and prefabrication in construction. There's a, there's a lot of great benefits. You have a lot less waste to begin with. Um, prefabrication can result in a 20% reduction in cost and up to a 40% faster uh, project timeline, which is important when you're trying to rebuild, obviously. Um, there's a lot of different design options available, all the way from more conventional looking structures here to more modern ones. Um, this is an organization bone structure that's building that has a system, a modular system out of steel frame. Um, so when you add fire resist resistive materials to a steel frame building, you end up with a very fire resilient building as well as energy resilient. There's also a, a really uh, growing database and number of providers. Um, this is a factory in Vallejo, factory OS, that's doing modular prefab for mostly for multi-unit buildings. Um, Katera is a large firm that has a really interesting platform that they, they have a factory coming up in Tracy. Um, and I think they do from single family all the way up through multifamily and commercial buildings. This is an example here of theirs. There's another company coming down from Canada that I'm actually partnering with called S2E Technologies. And they're doing full-blown smart communities that are net positive and net zero energy, including transportation up in Canada right now, and they're just gonna start bringing their projects down into California as well. I'm gonna talk briefly about a building we just finished in San Francisco. Um, it's called Solux Alpha, and it's the first Passive House certified multi-unit nanogrid building to the US marketplace. So a nanogrid is essentially a small microgrid that's comprised of a, a single energy system uh, for a single unit or a single home, generally. Um, this particular building is four units, it's six stories, and it's net positive energy by almost 50% uh, using only the PV within the building envelope. It's all electric, so obviously fossil fuel free. It's Passive House certified and U.S. Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Home certified. And the U.S. DOE Zero Energy Ready Home uh, also includes Energy Star, Indoor Air Plus, and EPA Water Sense, so it's covering more of the sustainability me measures than just the energy element that Passive House does. Um, we won a Department of Energy Housing Innovation Award and the Passive House Institute Best Overall Project Award for 2018. And this building is generating essentially tw almost twice the energy that the, that the owners need um, in their home. So the excess energy will drive electric vehicles for them up to 15,000 miles a year. So it ends up being a zero carbon living and transportation system. And if they don't own an EV, then that, that power gets exported to the grid or a microgrid potentially for community assets. So net positive energy, how do you get to this in a building? Especially, you know, this is a fairly tall building just using the solar on the roof. Um, we use Passive House as a baseline and then add it again, as Panama and Sean said, the most efficient electrical systems we could. Um, passive House methodology reduces the energy required for HVAC by 80 to 90%. It's also important to utilize passive solar design, so you really need to heat and cool the home much less by virtue of that, letting sun in the winter and shading in the summer appropriately. 
air source heat pumps for virtually for everything you can, essentially HVAC, demand hot water, clothes drying, and 100% LED lighting, of course. Um, and to address the plug loads, which, as Sean was pointing out, become a larger part of the energy use in a building when you have a high efficiency building in particular, we added automatic occupancy and vacancy sensors. So when you leave a room, not only will the lights automatically go out, but the plugs will as well. So you're eliminating those vampire loads that can really take a lot of energy up. Um, we do leave one hot plug in every room, so if you want to leave something charging, um, you can you can do so. All electric kitchens, and then in some of the next gen projects, we're going to move to DC appliances and systems because uh, all of the inversion losses from going DC in your on your PV to AC in your unit to DC in your battery back to AC in your unit that adds up to almost a 10% loss of energy in your system. These are some of the systems in the nano grid. It's solar plus energy storage, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, and um, we also included vehicle to building uh, wiring for this structure so that when the vehicles can give that power back to the building, and this is coming later this year, um, they, they'll be able to do so. Um, B2B enables also, if your vehicle can give the power to the building, that means it can also give it back to the grid and extend your energy beyond the building because it's on wheels. It'll reduce the need for site-based energy storage to create a very resilient structure. Because if you have 100 kilowatt hours in your car and your, um, your, your building only uses 10 kilowatt hours overnight, that's only 10% of your total storage in your vehicle. So you still can power your home through the night and have plenty of range to get to work or wherever you need to go the next day. These vehicles then can also become mobile energy assets for community resilience. So they're essentially mobile generators that can go out and power other buildings and, and facilities in the event of a, a grid outage. This allows the potential future of what I'm calling sort of a hybrid um, renewable energy and mobile microgrids. So you can move the power around with vehicles and plug it into different locations and, and take your energy with you everywhere you go. And uh, Over here on the right, you'll see that Volkswagen has announced they're getting into the energy supply business, and they're doing this with vehicle-to-building technology. So you're creating greater resilience by virtue of widely distributed systems, fewer single points of failure, and in a system such as this, you would also add community solar and storage at the points of grid connection. This is sort of a diagram of a microgrid here and it could be partially wire-based and partially mobile. And at the points of grid connection, you add community storage and solar, so that can become an asset for the larger grid. And yet it can also island from the grid when the grid goes out. So in closing, um, when I present this at, at the different conferences, people kind of look at me and they think it sounds crazy, but I want to ask you, what's better, stationary or mobile? You know, and for those that don't think a century-old wire-based industry can be displaced in a rapid amount of time by mobility, um, I point to the old wire-based landlines versus mobile phones. So this vehicle is essentially a mobile phone. It's an energy, a, a mobile energy storage device times 10,000, the amount of power that you have in it. It's complete democratization of energy, and it also help us reduce reduce uh, the need for fossil fuel peaker plants by virtue of having an aggregated mobile energy asset. So that's it for my presentation. Um, we'll open it up for questions now. Woo <laughs> Somebody's excited. Well, thanks very much, uh, John, Panama, and Sean. Um, we have just enough time for, for a couple of questions. Uh, so like I said uh, to you guys when we were practicing, um, you can just uh, we can we can field them on on the fly. So uh, if you feel like you've got a good answer, just uh, speak up and uh, and uh, and and uh, address the audience. So uh, the first question comes from Michael Eisenscher uh, from the Alameda Labor Council and Environmental Justice Caucus. Um, your examples were for new construction. What are the cost considerations in converting existing homes? Um, I think that was for me. This is Sean. Yeah. So it can lower it can lower retrofit costs. Um, you know, a furnace and an air conditioner, as an example, is more expensive than a reversible air conditioner, which is called a heat pump. 
So a furnace and air conditioner costs three thousand dollars, and a heat pump costs nineteen hundred dollars for the exact same product from the same manufacturer. So it, 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 you can look over at the water heater. Um, over in Europe, they have retrofit appropriate water heaters that are heat pumps that are just coming to the United States this year. So when I say retrofit ready, I mean like 120 volts. Uh, they use less than 50, so they can just exist in your existing wiring system with no retrofit cost. The stove, that can be more or less expensive depending upon how you do the stove. Uh, mine is less expensive because I use two two burner stove tops. I converted my kitchen from having a central oven range to distributed one, which is a lot more fun to cook with with my spouse. Um, we each have a very nice cooking station now, and that was much lower cost than any other solution that we could come to, gas or electric. I just have these two two burner induction ranges. Um, and the dryer is less expensive. I mean, you might have to do a you know 30 amp to 40 volt to it to get an electric dryer, but that's not a big deal. So that could be a little more expensive to, to wire a, um, the oven, sorry, to wire the dryer, or it could be more expensive to wire a stove. But when I say more expensive, I mean like $600, $400 for those two items, and you could save a thousand or two on the HVAC system and have more or less the same expense for water heating. It really doesn't have to be more or less expensive if you do it wisely. Uh, yeah. I agree. And there's there's been some pushback about, well, I'm going to have to upgrade my panel, you know, if I add all these electric loads. And that is a consideration. However, if you add solar and energy storage, that, that energy storage can be the power for the electric appliances that you're adding. So you don't really necessarily need a full panel upgrade if you do it appropriately. And, and yeah. rewiring. Uh, yeah. And, and the solar and battery is one strategy, and they're using efficient electric devices in the home. Like efficiency applies to electricity completely, where you can have the same job get done with less electricity. And if you have a limited amount of electricity in your panel, then you just choose more efficient devices. And so instead of using a 30 amp heat pump, you use a 15 amp heat pump, or you use a nine amp heat pump. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. how you approach it. And put the money in, in making your shell much more efficient, right? That deep energy retrofit that'll make just a, a more efficient building that requires less energy yeah. to heat to cool. But let me push on that for a moment, um, because I'm just going to talk about electrification. I'm not talking about any other type of, of fuel or any type, like any other retrofit. On getting rid of gas loads, <clears throat> you can do it for the same budget or you can spend more. On the topic of whether or not you should do a shell retrofit, yeah, everyone should do a shell retrofit and everyone should buy an electric car and everyone should do a few other important expensive things. But it's pretty low cost to electrify a home compared to the shell retrofit. Huh, interesting. Yeah, That's good to know. and you can get more, like think about this for carefully for a moment. If you have existing insulation in your walls and you want to do something better, you'd have to more or less double the insulation. But mm -hmm. that's like putting sheet foam outside and doing air tightening, all that kind of stuff, all of that. Mm -hmm. You can get that same benefit by going to a more efficient heat pump. I'm not saying it's going to be more comfortable in your home, but I'm saying you can get this same efficiency gain out of going to a more efficient heat pump that you can get investing in your shell. So I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's more comfortable or it's better or worse air quality. All those things I'm not talking about. I'm just saying efficiency. Got it. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, this question comes from Claire Broom. She's a consultant and a professor at Emory University. Uh, Claire asks, does anyone, can anyone provide more information on CPUC approving grid balancing payment and at what rate? And if there are any proceedings you can speak, you could uh, speak to, that would also be helpful. All right, so that's a brand new ruling that came out in February. And I think they're still working on the rates and implementation, um, but we can follow up with that and do a little uh, research. I, you know, I think that's huge because what the potential that has to drive the energy storage market is vast. If, if now all of a sudden your your energy storage and even your vehicle can become a grid balancing asset and you can get paid for it, I think that's gonna that's gonna speed adoption of energy storage and electric vehicles even at the same time. So we will do some research on that and get back to you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, the next question is from Giselle de Grandis from the Government of Ontario. 
Uh, Giselle asked, I'd imagine most of the webinar content would apply equally in colder places like northern states or Canada, as in San Francisco Bay Area. But are there any caveats to applicability you can think of? Yeah, so, you know, it, they do all electric above the Arctic Circle, but they do it new construction with like R40 walls and R80 attics. And that's because at negative 15 Fahrenheit, that's when the cold climate products have to go into resistance mode. And so that's the challenge is getting below negative 15. Um, and that's the, that's the point in which you really should invest in a significant shell retrofit as a part of electrifying so that um, you're not trying to run your whole house on, negative, on electric resistance during the, the worst of the weather. Yeah, I totally agree. That's where the retrofits and that's where for new construction, the passive house type of, of development you know, makes the most sense. So, you know, in northern climates, um, I think actually uh, Vancouver is looking at a passive house mandate or some kind of incentive. It should at the very least be heavily incentivized to invest heavily in, in shell performance. I totally agree. Well, well I, 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 Vancouver's not as cold as uh, the climate I'm speaking of. Um, That's like, true. Yeah. Uh, Alberta. And yeah. so, and this is, yeah. when, we, when we're looking at coastal environments, generally, while I hugely respect Passive House for its accomplishments, you know, going from 1,200 kilowatt hours a year down to 200 kilowatt hours a year is an example of what going to Passive House can look like. At the same time, you know, electric resistance water heater at 4,500 kilowatt hours a year versus the heat pump at 700 kilowatt hours a year is another place to get massive savings, potentially for less money. And I, so I look at Passive House out of Germany, that's where it was developed, as a, an appropriate, really, truly, um, like necessary, I should say, part of building in snowy and drier areas. And, mm -hmm. um, so that's my my opinion on it there. I, I think right. Vancouver can get a lot of its savings because they have a completely decarbonized grid already. You know, they just need right. to, I think, invest in mechanical efficiency and some more shell efficiency. Yep, I agree. All right, thanks guys. Um, we do have a, a lot of people still on the line. So I'm gonna try and get to these next two questions. The first one is from Ed Ryder from Ryder Consulting. Um, Ed asks, how do you measure and or evaluate resilience, specifically the improvements improvements to one, handling impact of an incident, and two, time to recover? That's a really good question, and that is a document and methodology that uh, the Clean Coalition is working on. We have we have a document, a working document uh, that addresses the value of resilience, and it's, it's really not going to be a fixed, um, you know, Thing for every building and every location, obviously, to sliding scale, a hospital or a fire station has a much a much greater need for resilience than a single family home does. Um, and maybe that, you know places of refuge in the events of emergencies would have again that higher value of resilience. So that's a document that we're working on. That I think are we ready to share that yet, Josh? Do we is that um, available to, to send out to folks, or are we still working on that? Um, I think. Uh let me check on that for you. Okay. I'll get back to you on that. Again, I can get we can back get to that as well. Okay, great. Yeah. And and perhaps send it out with our slide deck. You know, because I think it's a fascinating question as a part of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a great idea. Um, all right. We can send that out. Yeah, that should be no problem. So. Great. On one last question, this is from this is from Tanner Kural. Uh, Tanner asks, how can DERs or distributed energy resources defer potential grid upgrades that may be triggered by the increased load from electrification? That's an excellent question, and and it makes complete sense. The more distributed energy assets that you have that can power a community locally, the less need for for traditional grid. Uh, infrastructure upgrades or uh, improvements you you need so it really does and I'm down at a microgrid conference in San Diego this week and that subject has come up time and time again and it really makes a lot of sense for the utilities themselves to start investing in these these local uh, distributed energy resources as a substitute for traditional uh, 
uh, transmission and generation assets. Um, and they're also much safer, create local jobs, all the other benefits that go along with it. So yeah, that's, it, it definitely does uh, offset the need for, for traditional grid infrastructure. Great, thank you. And thank you, uh, Sean and Panama, for joining us, uh, along with John, for this webinar. Uh, very informative and uh, excellent, all three excellent presentations. Um, so it was before- a Pleasure, thank you. No problem. And uh, for uh, those remaining on the line, I just wanna show you on our website where we keep our past webinar recordings. If you uh, go to the homepage, you go up to events, and then to webinars. This is where we keep them, and uh, we're going to be uploading this very webinar, um, if not today, then tomorrow. Um, and we'll be, we'll be sending out, we'll be uploading the slides as well. So uh, keep in touch. You'll be receiving an email or two or three about our next webinar upcoming in June, I believe. So look out for that. And thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Have a great rest of your week. Yeah, and I also want to say, if you have if you have more questions, feel free to send them to us, and we will send you an answer back. You know, because we I, we didn't have a lot of time for questions, so I'll, I'd be happy to follow up, and I'm sure Sean and Panama would also. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.